Anything less is really unacceptable. Now, for the sake of argument, let's completely forget about our current monetary-based social system and take a fresh look at modern industrial production methods as would be implemented in a resource-based economy. The question to consider is, how do we design a production system that maximizes high-quality output, reduces waste, considers the dynamic equilibrium of the earth, and reduces repetitive and mechanical human labor? Based on the scientific method, Here's how the logical reasoning for industrial production methods would unfold. Step 1. Survey the planetary resources. Step 2. Decide on what needs to be produced, oriented by a priority ranging from bare necessities, such as food, water, shelter, to utility-based production items, such as raw materials, automation machines, and technological development, to production items used for non-utility-based purposes, such as entertainment, media, radios, musical instruments, etc. Step 3, optimization of production methods while maximizing the product's lifespan. Step 4, distribution methods for human access. Step 5, optimized recycling of the products that become outdated or inoperable. Step 1, survey the planetary resources. As denoted before, it is critical that we know what we have on this planet, for that translates into what the possibilities are. With this information, industrial production is always adjusted to compensate for any emerging scarcity along with the most mathematically appropriate raw material distribution based on availability and most relevant application. Any scarce resource is thus immediately addressed by seeking alternatives and substitutions. This awareness can be obtained by real-time electronic feedback coming from all resource sectors of the planet, fed into a central computer database that monitors any growing scarcity or problem. This idea of resource monitoring is not at all far-fetched, even if it might sound complex. This point will be addressed more so a little later in this presentation. Step 2. Decide on what production is required. What do we need? This is a very powerful question for, besides the obvious food, water, and shelter, most people today have no idea what they really want or need, for they have never been informed as to the true state of technology. What we think we need is directly a result of the state of technological development. Someone who has dust in his or her home might think, I need a vacuum cleaner. Are they sure? Perhaps what they actually need is a household pressure system that does not enable dust to enter or is equipped with electrostatic air filters that eliminate what dust there is. If we think very critically about what we think we need in a material sense, we can begin to see that needs are always in transition. Science and technology are barometers of utilitarian human need, and therefore all products made should be as advanced as that period of time makes possible. Our current monetary system, which generates wasteful, outdated products constantly just to keep the companies and economy going, does not have the ability or the desire to produce the most advanced tools for our use. This is because the majority of the products produced today would not exist if society focused on what would best serve the needs of society itself. Step 3. Optimization of production methods, maximizing product lifespan. If I was going to build myself a desk, I would try to make sure that desk would last as long as possible. That makes sense, right? If the desk breaks, that means I would have to build another one at the cost of more labor. It would seem logical that everything produced in society would have the longest possible lifespan that is technically possible. Sadly, the exact opposite occurs in our current system. For, as previously discussed, the monetary system thrives on multiplicity and planned obsolescence. Without it, the whole economy would collapse. In a saner world, we would make things that last. The optimization of production methods is about using the most powerful materials and methods while outputting the most long-lasting and effective products. Furthermore, human labor is not only currently being replaced by machines because it is more cost-effective in the profit system, machine labor is actually much better than human labor, and output statistics have shown this continually. This, of course, should be of no surprise. For a machine does not get tired and it is always more accurate and consistent than a human mechanically. High efficiency labor automation coupled with the scientifically managed resource abundance will allow for a fluid, near scarcityless environment which could be operated by only a small fraction of the population. Step 4. Distribution methods for human access. Distribution methods would also depend on the state of technology. For instance, production could theoretically become so streamlined that a product is only created when the request is actually made. Regardless, warehouse-like distribution centers, along with automated delivery, would be the most simplistic way for now. 
Also, since there is no money used in this system, there is little need for a person to hoard their items, and there is also no reason for a person to steal something that is available to everyone, and they certainly couldn't sell it. Also, in light of the fact that all goods in a resource-based economy are designed to last as long as possible, the consumer culture values that exist today would also be outgrown. Not to mention all the other value distortions imposed by advertising today, which makes people feel greedy, inferior, or inept. Advertising would not exist in this new system, outside of general product information available to a person who thinks they might need it. To obtain a product, a person would likely just go online, search for the item's functionality, select the item and request it. It would be available for pickup or delivery soon after. Step 5. Optimized recycling of the products that become outdated or inoperable. This step actually begins at the production stage, for each product design has had incorporated into it the consideration of recycling. Nothing ever used in production would be unsustainable or unrecyclable in some way. This is strategically considered to make sure that all older products are reused to the maximum amount enabled by known methods reducing waste. Now, one of the more confusing and difficult components for many to consider has to do with the deliberate focus of using machines to replace human labor whenever possible. The question is always, who will maintain the machines? Machinery today is now being combined with computerization. Essentially, a computer is the brain of the machine, and it instructs the machine what to do. This combination of machine and computer intelligence could be termed cybernation. Cybernated machines today are probably the most powerful and influential invention humanity has ever created. The possibilities of these tools are on pace to changing the entire fabric of society, beginning first with the freeing of the human labor force. In the words of Albert Einstein, Ultimate automation will make our modern industry as primitive and outdated as the Stone Age man looks to us today. This reality is not something we should fight. We should embrace it emphatically. Cybernation is the emancipation proclamation for humankind, freeing us from the drudgery of common labor, opening new horizons for human creativity and exploration. These cybernated machines far exceed the physical accuracy and endurance of the human body while also being able to compute at incredible rates, also far exceeding the computational speed and capacity of the human brain. As far as application, the first step is to ensure that the cybernated machines we devise are of the highest quality components and programming. In order to do this, we would have to outgrow the monetary system, for it perpetuates inferior products for the sake of cyclical consumption. There is no reason why everything in your home from your refrigerator to your stove to your television to your computer could not last your lifetime without physical repair. How can that be said with confidence? Because the best materials available on this planet, such as titanium, have sustainable properties that far exceed the life of a person by thousands of years. The cybernated machines would not be bought and sold, they would be built and designed to last. Not only will they have extreme durability and long lifespans, these advanced machines will eventually be able to repair themselves. In cars today, there are often warning lights on the dashboard that will alert you to a problem with a particular part of the car. This idea can be expanded in all machinery to the degree where not only is the machine's onboard computer aware of a problem, supplemental machines can thereby be directed to replace the broken part in real time. As fanciful as it may seem, self-repairing machines, structures, and even circuits are growing realities. The problem is that the production of such efficiency is not rewarded in the monetary system, so most people in society have no idea of what is actually possible. Furthermore, the role humans will play within this automated system will be that of supervisors, and nothing more. Once a fully integrated, autonomous, cybernated industrial system is set up, it is simply a matter of updating the system and making sure the system is in order. As time moves forward, we can only expect that the rate of our technological capabilities will continue to increase, perfecting this system. Now, while most people today recognize society's use of machine automation in manufacturing and the like, many have a very difficult time seeing how automation can be applied to complex jobs, such as doctors, architects, and the like. In order to consider this, we first have to ask ourselves what the true nature of our occupational roles really are. What exactly is a doctor, a carpenter, a plumber, or an architect? What are they actually doing? They recognize and react to observed patterns. When a doctor examines you, all he or she is doing is mentally referencing what has been learned. 
If you go to a dermatologist because you think you might have cancer on your arm, the doctor is going to examine the skin and mentally reference the patterns he or she has been taught. Then they might take a sample of the skin to be tested by machine analysis. It is a technical process. There is no reason why, say, an optical scanner connected to a computer database could not be invented which could scan your arm and immediately understand what problem exists. Even surgery, as sensitive as it may seem, is a purely technical process. It is simply a matter of time before extremely advanced machines replace surgeons. The same goes for every other utilitarian occupation in existence. And this brings us to a very critical realization, one that will have a profound effect on our progress on this planet. The conscious delegation of decision-making to computers is the next phase of social evolution.